Thank you again very much for inviting me uh, here tonight and uh, for coming out. Ani nindawe maganatak, nigagwege to magas, bine sikwe dago makwa indo deam, gawaba bane ka gish kanaganing and dunjiba, miguich, nindawe maganatak miguich. So I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, since the philosophy department is some of who invited me here, I wanted to talk a little bit about indigenous thinking on sustainability and uh, some of the teachings in our own community that I think have relevance to some of the scientific principles and the place that we are in right now. Um, but in saying that, um, you know, I want to start with a teaching from our Anishinaabeg community, uh, which is about our prophecies. And when I talk about those things, a lot of times, um, you know, we are all products of an American education, or most of us most likely are. And I find that um, most uh, indigenous things are quite often uh, not only marginalized and ridiculed, but not viewed as having the same validity as those things which come from a scientific paradigm or that come from a Eurocentric paradigm. And I don't think that this is probably a news flash to you, but I'm constantly reminded of it because I have kids that are in the public schools and they come home with these new amazing relevations. My daughter finally passed her North American Indians test. You know, my 14-year-old had got a D on her last one because she could not answer the question of which Indians were hunters and gatherers. And I was like, what, pray tell, would be the correct answer to that? You know? And the correct answer was, um, you know, the, the correct answer was the Plains Indians. And then I was like, who the hell are the Plains Indians? <laughs> I mean, you know, we get all kinds of Indians come to our house and stay there. We got the, you know, we got the Arapahoes and the Paiutes and the Lakotas and the, you know, and the, and the Cheyennes. And sometimes they stay for dinner and sometimes they stay a month, you know, but uh, we don't call them the Plains Indians when they arrive. You know, that's some kind of an anthropological construct that somebody made up to categorize people according to what would make them feel comfortable as to how people should be categorized. And so I say that um, because I think that uh, like even our teachings as indigenous people are quite often uh, not viewed as valid, but I see that increasingly there's an intersection between reality and those teachings. And, uh, you know, and, and so I am hopeful that there is more um, reckoning with those. But I find that day-to-day uh, -day on a policy level, it is a, a big struggle for many of us to have uh, our teachings recognized as valid. So having said that, what I want to say is that we have some teachings about our prophecies and, and all people have these teachings and it is always a good thing to try to pay attention when someone comes to your community. And um, it is said a long time ago that to the Anishinaabeg people, some people came and they uh, told us of the times ahead and they talked about those times in terms of fires. They did not say, uh, Julius Caesar calendar, 125 years from now this will occur. That was not really within our frame of reference. But what they said is that, um, that uh, in the times ahead that we would have some hard times and we would bring some of those hard times unto ourself. And I say that because no community has a monopoly on botching things up. Each community is perfectly capable to botch things up on their own. It is just really, from what I can ascertain, a question of if you have the humility and the commitment to fix it. Um, but, you know, that is what they said. They talked about our migration from the east to the west. Um, you know, I don't know about that Kennewick man and the uh, Aryan brothers or whoever is claiming him up there on the Columbian River. Uh, but I know that our stories talk about clearly our migration and where we came from and uh, how we moved. And they talked about our migration in uh, terms of the places we would go. And they said that we should go to the place where the food grows upon the water, which is what I'm going to talk about later. And the food they were talking about that grows upon the water was not water lilies, it was wild rice. That was our instructions as to where we were told to go. And we were also told if we did not go there, we was going to have a hard time, which was true, because we moved from the eastern seaboard. And uh, anybody knows from the history of this country is if you are an indigenous person who lived on the eastern seaboard, it is likely you do not live there today. Or it is very likely that if you are trying to live there today, you have a hard time getting federal recognition because the price of real estate is really high. And there seems to be a direct relationship between the price of real estate and the price of your federal recognition, from what I can ascertain. They talked about how uh, some people would come and some would have a good heart and some would have a bad heart. And that's true. You know, some people that came to this continent had a good heart and some had a really bad heart. And that is just the reality. 
And it is really important in America's uh, constant historical revisionism not to forget that. You know, that some people that came, you know, were really good, but some of the guys that came were not good people. And one of the problems in this country is, is that um, quite often the, the, the not good people are the people who got the most credit and are the people who are aggrandized. You know, one of the problems I have in this country, I have, you know, a few issues with a few things we could say, but one of them is the issue, for instance, of names. And there is even this issue in Oregon, but the issue that, you know, I always talk about this, have you ever heard of Amherst? You ever heard of Amherst College? Amherst Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, Amherst this and that. Lord Jeffrey Amherst, that's what's named after. One of the largest purveyors of smallpox ridden blankets. You know, the guy responsible for that genocide of hundreds of thousands of indigenous people. So what did they do? You know, they named towns and cities and colleges after the guy. The whole country is named like that. You know, Harney Peak. You know, guys responsible for mass murders. Um, out here they got, what's it called? Is it called Sheridan, Oregon? Sheridan, Oregon. There's another perfect example of that. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. That would be a Sheridan statement, you know? And I think about that and I think, well, in this day and age, we would not name a town after Eichmann or after Hitler. But in fact, we have a country that has a lot of towns and cities and streets. Shivington Street, the town of Shivington in Colorado, named after Shivington who was the one who took it upon himself, not even in the army, he was a Methodist minister to lead the Sand Creek Massacre. You know, they got a street in Denver named after the guy and a city in Colorado. You know, in this day and age, we wouldn't name towns after mass murders, but we got a whole country with names like that. And that is, you know, something that over time, I think it is incumbent upon us to find, find some redress. So that is the bad people who came story a little bit. And I say that because, uh, you know, I hear a lot of the, that happened a long time ago, so why don't you guys get over it? You know, and I want to tell you something is, is that, you know, when you see it in your face, you go into the town of Sheridan, you know, or you go into these towns and they are named and there's never any acknowledgement of what butchers those people were. You know, it is something that it, that it is, it is a black, it is, it is a bad thing to have in this country. It is something that I think we need to, in the new millennium, find some sort of redress for. They talked about how many of our people would disappear and, you know, we had no idea what was going to happen. But the depopulations that occurred, you know, from smallpox and epidemics and strychnine poisoning, no idea. Then they talked about that many of our items would disappear and that's our prophecies talking about this. And who would think? Who would think, you know, this young woman here from Alaska, Hurlishka from the Smithsonian, went and like hauled off half of the villages in Alaska and stuck all the items and the people <laughs> in the Smithsonian. I was interviewing this guy at the Smithsonian a couple of weeks ago, the Office of Repatriation. Heard of this issue, some of you? You know, very important issue to Indian country, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of ancestors sitting in boxes in museums, right? So he's a really nice guy, you know, and he's just his job and he's working really hard. I really, you know, he's a nice man trying to repatriate these items and these people, you know, back to where they're from. And, uh, you know, but who would think, you know, I remember talking to one old pe person in my village, one of, our, one of our ceremonial leaders, I said, what is that ceremony called for reburial? And, you know, we had to come up with a word for it because who would think you'd have to do it twice, you know? And that's what the ceremony is, the sending them off again ceremony. You know, the absurdity and the irony of the situation we find ourselves in as Native people, you know. But um, so he said, uh, he was talking about how, um, you know, they're trying to get these bones back to the places. And uh, so I asked him about the story of Ishi. Do you remember the story of Ishi, some of you? Known as the last Yahi, Northern California from the gold rush, walks out around 1920 or something like that. And Albert Krober finds him, takes him down to Berkeley, you know. Is that, that's right, isn't it? Something like that? Huh? Ursula. Right, Ursula Le Guin's father. So it hangs out down at Berkeley, dies of TB or something, right? And then, you know, his wishes were to be buried. But what happens? No, they don't bury him. They take his brain and send it to the Smithsonian, right? So for 70 years, his brain is sitting there at the Smithsonian, or 80 years or something like that. And they finally, someone figures it out, that it's out there at the Smithsonian. And they say, uh, 
Oh, there, but the guy from the Smithsonian said, I said, so what about Ishii's brain? You know, of course me, what about Ishii's brain? And he said, oh, well, we didn't lose it. We knew where it was. Berkeley didn't know where it was. You know, that was the, and that's how institutions are. Huh? The paperwork kind of gets shuffled between them and one of them forgets where someone's brain is for 70 years. But anyway, that was the story of Indian country. Isn't that pitiful? You know, I mean, yeah, it is just a, it is, but is this kind of the state of disarray. <laughs> that's what I would say. You know, so we're trying to get back all our body parts in Indian country. We're trying to fulfill our prophecies because in the sixth fire, they talked about that we go and start getting those things. And that's what we're doing. Go and get all those things. And you know, how could those guys 1,500 years ago know that? You know what I mean? That all those things would get taken and then we go find them again. You know, that we remember our songs and our ceremonies and our languages. We'd, and they say that the way we would remember who we were. That's what they said. Then they talked about this time that would come after that, and they call it the time of the seventh fire. And in the time of the seventh fire, and they say that that time is now. They say in the time of the seventh fire that our Anishinaabe people would have two choices ahead of them. And one, one Mikana, one road, they say, is well-worn, but it is scorched. That's what they said. The other path, they said, is not well-worn, and it was green. It is green. And they said it was our choice upon which path to embark. That's what they said. So I tell you that story because um, that was very significant to us as Anishinaabeg people. But our people that, you know, I, we inquire about that story and I, I talk to them about it. Uh, and they said that that story is not just about us. It is their perception that that is very much where we are as a society, you know. And I, so I, I, I tell that to you because a lot of times, even whether it is in ethnic studies or whatever, there is always kind of this ghettoizing of Native studies or Native American people or indigenous teachings as something that is kind of a little special interest group that has perhaps no relevance to scientific thinking or scientific paradigms or, you know, whatever. And I, uh, I think that is wrong. I think that is wrong. And I think that what those people were saying you know, a long time ago, they were right. So having said that, I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit of, of our thinking. Um, can I get that water, which I set over there? Otherwise, I'll be, I can drink out of this big bottle too, but I'll. So, yeah, that cup is mine. Thank you. So we have a teaching in our community. Thank you very much, Kurt. Which is a teaching that says, the Creator's law is the highest law, higher than the laws made by nation, states, or municipalities. The Creator's law is the highest law. One would do well to live in accordance with the Creator's law. I always remember that, you know. We are small and pitiful in the spectrum of things, really. We are just little, you know. Our teachings, all our teachings as uh, Anishinaabe people are about that we were the last ones to arrive, the plant beings the winged creatures, the four-legged, the ones in the water, they all got here first. And we were totally dependent upon them. That's our teaching, you know. Nindawe Muganatuk, Nindawe Muganatuk, we are all related. That's another one of our teachings. As uh, Anishinaabe people, that is our teaching. Which says that, uh, you know, it says exactly that. But it also says that those relatives, those relatives are deserving of respect. That even the most pitiful relative, or what we would view as being low on the invertebrae or the vertebrae chain or something, you know, that they are also of significance. You know, even in our, in our society, in our teachings, there is a story, the muskrat, and they say that the muskrat is who saved our people, the muskrat. You all know what a muskrat is? Yeah, it's a little tiny guy, you know? And nobody thought he could do it, but he did. And I think about that a lot because I, I live in Minnesota, and in Minnesota there's this big, you know, it, it is, I won't say it has died down because it still exists, but there was this big debate about the frogs. Do you remember this? Some of you are in sciences. The why the frogs were all dying in Minnesota, right? 
And everybody's like, you know, there's all these studies and this arguing and this and that. And the, I saw some absurd report that it was like the space aliens or something that were killing the frogs. I mean, you know, these scientists, oh, not to diss scientists, but it is ridiculous. You know, the expanse of money that is spent on studying things, you know, so they breathe through their skin, those frogs, huh? They take in everything through their skin and they live in fields that are covered with pesticides. Oh, right must be the ultraviolet rays and things from space affecting them. You know, not to appear so trite, but at times I get a headache, you know? But of course it would have no relevance to us because they're just frogs, right? You know, that is not our teaching. That is not our teaching. So I say that, Nindawe Muganatak, Mino Bamadaziwan, the good life. We're told, we are told, that we should uh, manage ourselves. Not said about the process of managing nature. Minopamata see when our business is in managing ourselves because we are the ones that could do the most damage. And we are the, the youngest of the relatives. That's what they say. So they say, you know, our teachings, take only what you need and leave the rest. Be careful, do not be greedy. Every indigenous community, from what I know, has these teachings, do not be greedy, because it is a big mistake. If you offend the creation, if you are wasteful, you'll not be able to guarantee that you keep eating if you do that. We're told, and, and even in our languages, you know, I am a really uh, pitiful speaker of Ojibwe. You know, I go to our ceremonies and uh, I see those old people leaning over and saying, Could, would you say that one more time? I think I got that, or sometimes they say, but they, they tell me, uh, what they say is that our, uh, in our language, a lot of our nouns are animate. Like the word, it is, I'm not sure why some things are. That's just the way it is. But a sin, the word for stone is an animate noun in Ojibwe. The word for, you know, raspberry is animate. Miskumin. Miskuminag. Car is also animate, which I'm not sure why. <laughs> but that is just, there's something going on there. You know, and I guess what that says when you uh, reflect upon a language and the teachings within it are that um, those things have spirit. They have standing. No. We are taught uh, in our language as well and in our, in our systems, you know, I, I refer again to my, my teenage daughter who in her Western civilization class, I just hate that. I just hate that Western civilization class. Oh my gosh. As you, well, you don't even need to hear me start on some of the things that are taught in that class. But one of the things that is taught in there is that civilization is, what, you know, and I looked this up in the dictionary this morning because I wanted to see if it said it in Webster's. It doesn't say it in Webster's, but she is teaching kids that to have a city is a sign that you are civilized. <laughs> so what exactly does that mean? That means that people who did not have large urban areas were not considered civilized is what she is teaching kids. Now it doesn't actually say that in Webster's, but I think that it is inferred. I think it is inferred that people do not, you know, that people are civilized according to some kind of paradigm. That, you know, I don't even want to say it's Eurocentric, you know, but it is, it is, uh, it casts aspersions. So our system is different. You know, I, I studied our systems of governance in our community, Anishinaabe communities. And you know, if I am to describe a system of governance in our community, I would describe it like a flock of geese. That's how I would describe it. It's a decentralized form of government, and at certain times, certain folks are in charge. And the same one is not in charge all the time. Hmm. So what that means is, you know, you ever watch a flock of geese move? Do you ever notice that there's not one goose at the front all the time? Like, I don't know how they figure out that migration, but they got something going there. You know, that is a long distance to move, but it is not the same goose, and that's because it's too hard to be the one at the front all the time. And so someone else has to go in, they, they move like this, right? 
you know, and then they go back and then they, but that is how they do it. If I, you know, when I ask our, our people, that's, you know, kind of it. It's a decentralized form of government. Do I think that those teachings have some relevance? Yes. I think they have absolute relevance to kind of the, the predicament we have got ourselves in, in our, you know, industrial, scientific, I don't want to just say capitalist, I mean, just the paradigm we got ourselves into. Instead of, of teaching that the creator's law is the highest law, we live in a society and we live in institutions just like this, which teach an entirely different set of laws. And a set of laws which, which illustrate the practice of man's dominion over nature. A set of laws in which we love to uh, trade pollution credits, change allowable levels, now, one of my favorite ones here, I'm going to have to find this one quote. Where did, I, I didn't lose the bifocal quote, did I? A friend of mine faxed this to me. But a perfect example of that is this problem on the Klamath River. You know, there is only so much water in the river, right? And so the Bush administration says, well, actually, the fish can make it. Well, guess what? They can't, you know? So they project 60,000 fish to come back, and 33,000 of them die. I mean, you know, that is a perfect example of the problem. There's only so much water, and you can, uh, you can look at it in different ways. So I'm going to try to find this one thing. Kurt, I didn't leave it over there, did I? I'm already starting to squint looking for this thing. Mm. I don't know. It's a really small set of quotes. Anyways, of course, it was about the Bush administration. And in December, they did some, uh, they, did, they announced a new set of changes. No, I don't need the glasses yet. I, I just have to find the paper first. <laughs> then I was, my friend faxed it to me. I was laughing at it, though, because I was like, you know the fax of a really small email? You know, my eyesight is still pretty good, but it won't be very good if I can't find the damn paper at all. But anyway, they announced 300 separate uh, regulations that they were looking at changing. Did you guys follow this announcement? Well, the 300 separate regulations that they were going to change included these ones that were really good. Some of my favorite were, oh, here, I got it right here. I'm sorry. Of course, I had it sitting up here. Are you guys laughing at me? I can see. I want you to know. But look at this. Can you guys read that? And I watch this. This is really something else, huh? 300 federal regulations that may modify or rescind in the coming year at the request of industries and consumer groups. Now, not all of them are bad. Public Citizen is in there saying a couple things. But I really like this one, the Boeing Company proposed that the Federal Avi Aviation Administration lower the minimum amount of fresh air required in airplane cabins, <laughs> saying the current minimum is unattainable and does not increase safety. Well, there you go, huh? <laughs> it's not part of that Patriot Act, so you don't need the air, huh? <laughs> Are you anti-terrorist? You don't need to breathe on the dang plane. The Farm Bureau Federation proposed that the Fish and Wildlife Service remove from the endangered species list grizzly bears in Yellowstone National Park, don't need them, huh? Gray wolves of the Great Lakes region and bald eagles saying that they have met their recovery goals. And then uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute proposed that the EPA reconsider a rule that would ban the public from using pressure-treated wood that contains arsenic. The Institute said that Retooling a plant that makes such wood would cost as much as two hundred thousand dollars. So there you go. You know that's so. You know, I'm not going to say the foundation of these. Uh, um, and then Joseph Lieberman even said something. Imagine that. <laughs> no, he said something good. I was like, one of those Democrats actually said something. He said, what the administration would really like to be spending its time is on identifying weak spots in the regulatory fabric instead of, trying to immuno and instead of trying to immunize polluters and other wrongdoers from important health, safety, and environmental protections. I'm actually not sure what he said there. That's not really clear. But anyway, that was a perfect example of this problem. Um, so what is the impact? You know, we change the allowable regulations, we uh, modify them, we, with, we withdraw them. So, you know, right now we've got about 100,000 chemicals in the environment. That's the estimate from, you know, Lester Brown World Watch Institute. That's, you know, we don't even know how to pronounce 90% of those chemicals. They're showing up in everything from sperm to the stratosphere. 
You know, that is the reality. And, and you take a blood test of an average American, you're going to get 200 different chemicals in it. You know, and most of those chemicals did not exist 50 years ago, definitely not 100 years ago. You know, and some of them didn't exist, you know, when, at the time I was born 40 years ago. You know, that is the absurdity of the, of the situation. And we have absolutely no idea of the combined impact of those chemicals. You know, we got in 1999, 7.8 billion pounds of toxic chemicals was released into the environment in the United States. 7.8 billion pounds, 28 per, pounds per person. You know, electrical uh, generation and uh, mining. That is, uh, you know, the perception that somehow man's laws are, are greater than creator's laws. And I'm thinking there's some folly to that. You know, there's something that, that we might be a little short in that. Nindawe Muganatuk, instead of the perception that uh, we are all related, you know, institutions, even like OSU, I and can't say anything bad about OSU, but, you know, these institutions have, for, for many years, for many years, taught single species management systems. It is only recently that ecosystem-based management systems have come into practice. And so you've got an entire archaic set of, of practices which have caused what we have today. You know, we have, the, the perfect example is the collapse of most fishery stocks. You know, sending out, whether it is through the use of factory trawlers, um, you know, mining the oceans for whatever, sucking it up, you know, and, and discarding what, about a third of it as bycatch. I think that's what they, you know, it's about a third. Dead as a doorknob back into the ocean. You know, anything that was not what they happened to be of harvesting that day. Or, you know, um, the, um, most of the fisheries, 17 major fisheries, are all harvested beyond their sustainable capacity according to the UN. And then there is the problem of uh, the fact that, that most of those fisheries, 90% of the fish that are out there rely on, if it is not a coral reef, it's an estuary at some point. And so if you are doing a management system that is based on managing and harvesting for the ocean and not related to where the fish come from, um, you know, you're going to have what we have today. You know, you have the combination between over harvesting and the demise of the ecosystem that the, that the fishes need to relate to. The fishes, excuse me, fish. I know what the plural is. Take only what you need and leave the rest. That would be our teaching. That would not be this teaching. You know, factory trawler is the perfect example of that. The things that really are uh, madden me right now, two issues in energy development, obviously, the ANWR. You know, the idea of, you know, opening up something that should not be opened up in the first place. The idea of setting some limits and saying, we are not going to open that up because that, that just should be left alone. You know, the society has, has and, and the Bush administration obviously has no interest in that. But the other thing is this, have you, has some of you followed this issue around the black uh, Mesa aquifer? Some of you? You know, it's, a, it, it's an area in northeastern uh, Arizona on the Navajo and Hopi Reservation. It is, a, you know, a very significant area, but it is a huge coal field. Uh, Peabody Coal um, is who has been mining there for many years, and they have created widespread environmental problems, but huge human rights violations. That's where the relocation of the 10,000 Diné or Navajo people, um, and largely that is because of Peabody Coal and their influence and, and their power. But in addition to that, the thing that bothers me is it is a desert. And so that company, not only does it strip mine the coal, but in addition to strip mining the coal, what they do is they slurry the coal 273 miles from the mine site to a power plant in southern Nevada. And so why the hell would you slurry in a desert? You know what I'm saying? They're taking a pristine water resource and they are turning it into toxic sludge. And so every year, they take uh, one million gallons of uh, water, a billion gallons, excuse me, of water, enough to provide for the Hopi community for 100 years. And they do that in a, in, in a year. And they take it and, it and it basically, you know, it is totally destroyed. And it ends up evaporating into the Nevada skyline. You know, that is the blasphemy of industrialism. That is the, the destruction that occurs. And, and it is now all of their wells are, are diminishing. You know, there are some really tough grassroots groups down there. 
fighting it. The Black Mesa Water Coalition, the Black Mesa Trust being two of them. You know, a lot of uh, Natural Resources Defense Council has taken an interest in it, Glen Canyon Institute. But it is, you know, such these issues that Indian country finds itself in, where, you know, you have some of the poorest and people who are geographically and politically um, most challenged facing some of the largest corporations in the world. Then we have this issue of animate and inanimate. You know, we have a view of things being animate, alive, having standing. Industrial society has an entirely different view, viewing things as natural resources to be exploited. Then finally, this problem of centralized or decentralized. We have an entire paradigm based on building of centralized systems. You know, that is America. Centralized power production, um, you know, between the coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, and dam projects that should never have been built to that size. You know, the building of centralized power systems in this country, um, the loss, not only you know, the, the, the ecological loss in the direct area, but just even the inefficiency of the loss of electricity between the point of, of uh, production and the point of distribution. You know, those high voltage transmission lines. It is, uh, you know, a set of systems that uh, were done wrong. And it is the challenge that we face um, in our time ahead. You do not need, I'm sure, a lecture on the impact of all of this today. But the issues of global climate change and, uh, you know, and, and the impact of our 532 million vehicles <laughs> that are on the roads, the, the, tra the transformation of our vehicle systems to uh, urban assault fleets, as uh, Bill McKibben calls them. It's true, you know? You know, who the heck needs most of those cars we got out there? I mean, that is absurd. You know, I was thinking we should require a needs assessment or a needs certificate if you needed an SUV, you know? Of course, that's our God-given right as Americans, though, isn't it? If you've got the money, you can buy the biggest you know the ugliest vehicle I ever saw? It is the ugliest vehicle I ever saw. I saw, I don't know if any of you ever saw this, and I can't even remember where I saw it, but I saw a, uh, it was a uh, Humvee limousine. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen, you know, they have like different kinds of limousines that, did anyone ever see one of these before? Yeah. That is ugly. <laughs> that was ugly, you know? And I was like, that is like the most insulting vehicle I could even imagine. <laughs> you know, so today we have uh, global climate change, you know, things are melting, infectious diseases and water levels are rising. You know, even the insurance company has taken note. Munich Re, the world's largest reinsurer, um, you know, said, you know, it's tripling, tripled between the uh, 1960s and the 1990s, and they're projecting up to $350 billion a year in climate change-related damages by, like, 2020. You know? What makes people change? You know, my theory, I actually talked about this. I was asked to give a lecture to Prudential Life Insurance, and that's what I talked about. I was like, you know? You know, I could say change occurs because, you know, Munich Re's estimates might make somebody be concerned. It's going to cost. And you can either pay now or you can pay later. You know, you can pay for transforming society now or you can just pay later. And obviously, you know, the Bush administration is kind of in the pay later category. You know, I do not think that that is the, is, is the answer. I could say that the other reason that change would occur my favorite is my quote, uh, I like quoting Tom Goldtooth, who's the one who said, change in this society will occur then when the white men realize that their testicles are shrinking. You know? <laughs> it is true, though, you know? <laughs> when, they're, you know when they realize, then he said, then water will f money will flow like water to the environmental movement. <laughs> it's true, you know? We'd like to avert things before there's too much testicular shrinking, but, you know. So how do you make change? How do you make change? And there are a multitude of ways. You know, I think that most of us would agree that there are two trends that are occurring simultaneously. The, the jackhammer trend that we see in, all around us is that is globalization. You know, 
evidenced by Walmarts, evidenced by the mergers that you don't even know who your company is anymore. You know, every time you look, there's a new set of mergers and you know, that the, the most offensive is of course in the media. I shouldn't say the most offensive, but I find it incredibly, you know. But you know what, I, I, you know, I, there's a lot of things that irritate me, but you know, obviously I was not a, I'm not a supporter of George W., but I was not a supporter of, of Clinton either. And the fact is, is that what is going on with the media right now is largely because of Clinton's rollback in terms of the, uh, the uh, federal communications and allowing the, the, the rollback of the laws which uh, did not allow for monopolies in communications. And so since about 95, we've seen a massive concentration in the media. And, uh, you know, I think it, it is incredibly frightening. Those of us who have engaged in anti-war protests and seen that our numbers are not reported, you know, or you do not appear. Um, you know, I didn't actually watch from this weekend how things were, were reported, but, um, you know, it is, it is of deep concern, the concentration in the media, as well as the concentration in, in many other industries. The other, the other um, trend which is occurring that it is incumbent upon us to, to nourish is uh, relocalization, if that is the term we would use for it. I mean, that is one term that is used. You know, and you saw it 15 years ago with the rise of the, uh, the micro roasteries and the micro breweries, micro breweries for beer, right? You know, and then the micro, and the micro wineries, or vineyards, I guess they're called, or micro, I don't know what they're called actually, but those things. And the micro roasteries, right, for the little coffee places, the little coffee roasters. And the uh, micro, now the micro cheeseries and the micro soaperies. You know, there's like a billion places in which to, uh, you know, increasing. And I think that uh, that, that trend towards an interest in relocalizing our food production, consumption, um, and and you know I don't want to just say put your money where your mouth is, because that kind of oversimplifies the situation. Because you have to put your money where your mouth is, but you have to fight the bad guys at the same time. You know that is the reality. You have to to work to preserve and strengthen um, all of that which is in our local communities. So having said that. The issues that are of deep concern, um, some of the issues that are of deep concern in the native community now have to do with these issues of globalization, biodiversity, and genetic modification, which are issues that are of concern, I'm sure, to many of you here tonight. I would like to talk about it specifically in terms of the issue of wild rice, which is kind of the framework that I'm most familiar with. I mentioned earlier that uh, wild rice is uh, something that is in the migration story of the Ojibwe, instructed to go to the place where the food grows upon the water. The wild rice is something that is used in all of our ceremonies and, and in all of our uh, um, feasts. You have to have rice uh, because it is a food, even in its name, Monomen, Monomen. It means the good seed or the seed that the Creator gave us. That's how significant rice is to us. It is like, you know, in some, in some communities, corn is to them. We have entire, uh, you know, so much is, is based upon that. So, so our community for many years has, has harvested rice. It is why uh, Anishinaabe people, it grows in the Great Lakes region. And it is why uh, we are there. It is also why the Anishinaabe people um, have done so well in our area because we had a stable food source. Our community, our rice grows on all these lakes and each rice is different. Um, some is fat and some is skinny, some is tall and some is short. Some comes in earlier and some comes in later. Um, some grows in streams and some grows in, in lakes. Um, that is to say that that is the biodiversity that is rice and it has ensured its, its strength for all of these years. So for instance, if you do not have a good rice crop on one lake, it is quite likely it'll be someplace else or on a river nearby. And that is, how, uh, that is why it has been such a significant source of n nourishment to our community as well. It's, uh, it has been a source of um, income to the Anishinaabe, Menominee, Potawatomi, 
Odawa people for many years as well, uh, both as a trade source with, traditionally with other Native people, but then also in more recent years uh, as a source of income to our communities. You know, you go out on a, on a lake, two Indians get in a boat, and you uh, get in a canoe, and uh, I, I uh, poll this year, I usually knock, and um, once it's in front and you bring the rice in and you go like this, that's how you harvest your rice. And um, you, knock, you have these sticks and you knock it into your boat as you go through the rice beds. And then when uh, you are done, you pull your boat off and you load it into gunny sacks. And then you uh, bring it in and you, and you let it out to dry. And then usually the next day is when, after it has dried some overnight, then it's you parch it. And we have big uh, drums that are, big drums, I don't know, big, <laughs> like this big and they're long. <laughs> you know, you could use like a 55 gallon drum or you know, something longer than that is what we use. We use a wood fire and then you turn it for about 20 minutes or I don't know, 30 minutes over the fire. And then uh, you take it out and, and uh, winnow it like this or else now they have a machine, you know? Well, if, well, actually, first you dance on it. That's what they did, just like the grape thing, you know? You dance on the rice with your new moccasins, or now we have a machine that you can do that too, and then you winnow it, right? And then after that, uh, you uh, have rice. And then you have your feast, you know, your Thanksgiving feast, and, uh, and that is uh, where wild rice comes from. And it is how we produce it and it is interesting because uh, the organization I, I work for on my own reservation is called the White Earth Land Recovery Project but we, we uh, have wild rice, it's called native harvest rice. Um, but we're one of the largest wild rice producers in the state of Minnesota and I was trying to upgrade some of our equipment because it was all built in the 40s, right? And uh, it is kind of like the issue like the Amish is that you know all of the new equipment is for patty rice industry. You cannot get the, the right equipment anymore. It's the wrong size. You have to make it yourself. You know, it is interesting because it's an intermediate technology. Um, and that's, we make choices over certain things. And those are the choices we make. You know, we don't use a gas dryer. We use wood, those things, because that's the right way to do it. You know, and so, uh, so that is uh, what we do. The University of Minnesota, um, a few years ago in the 1960s, decided to have had a brainstorm and decided to, uh, domesticate wild rice. They went out there and stole some seeds. That's how it always starts. Huh? They went out there and stole some seeds and they took them in and they started working with their seeds and domesticating and creating hybrids of their rice. And they grow it in rice paddies in northern Minnesota. Then they drain the paddies and they use uh, uh, malthion and uh, a, f a fungicide, now I forgot, on it. On it. Well, they were using a number of things, but m mostly the malthion on it. And they drain it, their patties, and then they harvest it with a combine, right? They modify their combine, they go in there, and then they get the rice like that. So we were really mad about that to start with because it was our rice that they took, and then they changed the rice, and then our concerns were is that they would contaminate our rice beds if some of those hybrids got into the water, you know, were discharged into the waterways. So that is one of our first concerns. But um, the University of Minnesota did that and around 1977, the state of Minnesota declared wild rice the state grain, which was kind of the kiss of death because they were so proud of themselves at the University of Minnesota that they forgot to take note that there is a place that grows far more rice in the country, which is Northern California. And so within about two years, Northern California had outstripped Minnesota in paddy rice production. So today, three quarters of all wild rice that is on the shelf, pretty much at any food store you go into, is grown in diked rice paddies in Northern California with all of these different chemicals and um, all of this water that they should not have. Um, it is growing essentially an aquatic crop in the desert, um, which is kind of has a set of problems associated with it. We um, have been very upset about this issue because when they dumped that rice on the market, it totally gutted the, the uh, rice e economy of northern Minnesota and Wisconsin and Ontario and Manitoba. And our communities are not economically rich. Most of the people there are 
at or below the poverty level. And so selling rice has been a major source of income. So it is really also a fair trade issue in our communities um, in that you could buy your rice uh, from a patty rice producer in California. You could buy it from some people in northern Minnesota. It is also now an issue of biopiracy because what has happened is, is that they took our rice and they made the California wild rice industry and now we got really mad because a couple of years ago the University of Minnesota figured out how uh, to map the genome of wild rice, which is what you do not want to have done in this era. So they completed the map of the genome, a couple of the researchers went off to work for Monsanto and DuPont, and now we are looking at uh, new challenges. We are looking at, first of all, that they have uh, uh, a guy in California, NorCal Wild Rice, has patented wild rice. Um, and we have some problems with that, as you may imagine, you know. I ethically think that, I think that patents are for toasters. You know, patents are for gadgets. Patents are not for living things. And I have significant moral and ethical questions about patenting life. Um, our communities do not like the patents. Um, our tribes, uh, our organization works with about 19 tribes and most of the Canadian bands are coming on board now. And they have engaged in a very deliberate process now asking the company, instead of just Im immediately looking at challenging the patent, they have asked the company to, uh, to explain why they would do that. Because that is kind of our process. They wanted to know why they did that and why they thought that that was okay. And so we're in this long legal process right now. But we anticipate challenging these patents on the wild rice um, issued to the NorCal Wild Rice Company. We are also um, concerned about genetic modification of wild rice. There are two Australian researchers out of the Australian Rice Research um, Institute who have uh, applied for a patent on GMO rice. And um, th what they have done is bombarded the genes of uh, wild rice with the, ge with the genes of, of uh, japonica, I think is the strain that they are using, which is uh, the major white rice strain. And then they have done it in reverse. Um, their patent is at the patent office right now, and it looks like it may be denied. Um, and so we have, um, I have some information on our rice campaign, but if you look up either Native Harvest or the White Earthland Recovery Project, or I think we now own protectwildrice.org. I was like, someone should try to find us. So I think we did that. Um, you can see the letter. And if people are interested in sending emails to the patent office to tell them to deny the patent to the Australian researchers, uh, we would appreciate it. Because we would not like to see any genetically modified rice patented. And obviously our concern about that are the concerns that many other people have and that it might contaminate our rice. We are the source, the point of origin of wild rice. Um, and if uh, any of that GMO rice gets into Minnesota or Wisconsin or in our rice beds, we are concerned that it could per permanently genetically alter our rice. And that diversity, um, you know, whether it is creating hybrids or genetically modified rice, it is entirely about the process of creating uniformity. Creating something they can all harvest at once, that they can treat with the same chemicals, that they can have, you know, their mechanistic process on. And what we know, and what I think most people with a little bit of common sense know, is that biodiversity is the essence of sustainability. And you're in a lot better shape if you've got a biodiverse crop than if you have a monocrop. You know, I would have thought that the Irish potato famine would have taught someone that. You know, but apparently, you know, in the case of, of where we are with our food stocks now, that is not the case. So that is our campaign. Uh, so that is what we work on, this wild rice issue. Uh, another issue in brief that we are working on now, I thought I would just broach with you, is, um, you know, I don't really know how to say it, but what I will just kind of blurt out is that uh, it would be a really good idea to transform our energy system if we want to avert global climate change, you know, and a lot of other environmental problems we have. So I'm a big proponent of, um, of wind energy. You know, I'm, um, you know, there are obviously solar, hydrogen, also very key uh, sources. But it is, you know, ironic that, uh, 
you know, wind energy is not where it should be in the United States. The Danes are still building the majority of, I, you know, I totally love the Danes, but, you know, they still, the majority of the technology is coming out of Denmark because the United States is really quite far behind in wind energy. Germany is uh, leading uh, the industrialized world in wind energy. And 19% uh, in the northernmost state, 75% in some states. Um, the price has gone down quite a bit from about 19 cents a kilowatt hour to 4 cents a kilowatt hour. But the thing I just want to say specifically to a lot of you, you know, whether it is here on the Columbia River or, you know, uh, the issues in, uh, is that a lot of these, um, you know, it is perhaps not of as much significance to you, but what I will tell you is that the Great Plains is known as the Saudi Arabia of wind power. And there is a good reason for that, you know. And uh, as you may imagine, the windiest communities in the Great Plains would happen to be Indian reservations. That would be because that's what we got, you know. And that's what they say. They say like on, on, uh, on Blackfeet, you got to lean forward when you walk. It's so darn windy up there. You know, it is, it is really windy on all of those reservations. And so it turns out that there's 23 Indian tribes in the Great Plains who have 350 gigawatts of wind potential. Gigawatts, that's a big word. Gigawatts is uh, present US installed electrical capacity is 600 gigawatts. So you guys all get that figure? Present US installed electrical capacity is 600 gigawatts. 23 Indian tribes in the Great Plains are projected to have 350 gigawatts of wind potential. Talk about some alternative energy, you know. And the thing about wind, um, there are tribes here, the uh, Umatillas are looking at wind, Warm Springs is looking at wind, the Macaws and the Yakimas are all looking at wind power. I mean, there's been some controversial projects proposed for the Columbia River Basin. They shouldn't try to put some things up in some places, um, but there are some places that are plenty windy. And uh, I say that, uh, you know, so um, I, have n I, I decided a while ago that I was not going to hold my breath for George W. <laughs> I'm thinking that uh, that would be a stupid thing to do. <laughs> you know, so instead, uh, you know, we looked around and uh, we found that there's a number of other ways to, uh, to do it. There are some good initiatives, and I am not sure. I know that the BPA is looking at some initiatives. I'm not a fan of BPA. I know that the Western Area Power Ath Administration in the Great Plains um, is, is looking at fulfilling their contracts because, I, I don't know if that occurs out here, some of you probably know this better than I, but, but the Great Plains has these dams uh, that is where they generated electricity from that they put up and flooded out these Indian communities, of course. And uh, those dams could not meet their contracts this summer because there was not enough of a recharge in the Rockies. And so there wasn't enough water running through the Missouri River to keep the dams going and to sell power. And so they replaced their power, stupidly enough, with power from this company called Basin Electric, which is the single largest CO2 emitter in the country, you know, bad coal. So it's kind of like, shoot yourself in the foot, right? Yeah, you got global warming. Why would you want to buy power from the worst company? You know, when the alternative would be right in front of you, of course, which would be wind. And uh, I don't know what BPA is like if the, if the dams were at lower capacity because of the absence of a recharge as well. I don't know, someone probably knows that, but. What I am trying to say um, in kind of a long way is that, you know, the thing is, is that you put up a wind tower, you uh, um, have some upfront costs, um, but you know what, you don't have to pay for your resource after that. You don't have to pay for the wind, and you know what else is you don't actually have to go to war to get it. You know, and I think that that is a remarkable idea. <laughs> um, so we are working with these guys called Native Energy who are out of Vermont, and uh, the Intertribal Council on Utility Policy. Native Energy is organizing green power purchases to leverage specifically purchases for you know, some different farms, and now we're working with them on these tribal wind generators. The first tribal wind generator that is commercial is, is uh, scheduled to go up in the next month. 
on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, a 750 kilowatt generator. Um, we are looking at two generators on Pine Ridge. And most of these other tribes also um, have good wind potential. And so what they do is they buy um, these green tags. It's kind of this regulatory thing. They retire carbon emissions. Um, the person who buys them or the industry that buys them gets you know, a business expense, but also gets a tax write-off for donating their green tags. And uh, some of the proceeds of that are used to finance the upfront costs of these wind turbines. It's kind of a long technical process. If you're interested, Native Energy's website, our organization, Honor the Earth, also. But uh, we were waiting, you know. I noticed, as some of you may have also noticed, that uh, George W's vocabulary is a little limited. <laughs> I have been hoping to, this word, this word uh, decommissioning, I always think that is a good word. Decommissioning is a really good word. That's kind of the owning that you made a mistake and you should take it down word. Applies to dam projects, applies to nuclear power plants. You know, not in Cheney or Bush's vocabulary. But that is uh, really it, you know. Look at that, look at putting up some wind. So these guys at Native Energy, they help finance uh, with the tribes, Inter-Tribal Council on Utility Policy, this Rosebud Generator. They got these organizations like, uh, you know, Timberland Shoes and Ben and Jerry's, you know, a bunch of others to buy this wind power. And Ben and Jerry's even has this new ice cream out. Have you seen this, One Sweet World? It's the wind energy ice cream. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, one sweet world, you know, I'm thinking, you know, what do you want? You want to hang out with Dick Cheney and bad nuclear power plants and burn dinosaurs? You want to eat ice cream with Ben and Jerry's and make wind power, you know? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Not a, I, I think that the choice is, you know, it's tough in there. I'm thinking wind. So um, that's what we're working on. I decided I didn't want to hang out with Dick and do the nuke thing. I'm, do, I'm doing the wind thing. So that I'm telling you about that because there's a lot of ways you can organize and leverage in. I don't, you know, I don't know specifically, but I know that these tribes should be coming online. And if you're interested in native energy and, and this whole initiative, I went and I talked uh, on Friday. I was down in San Francisco. And I went and I talked to um, this lady named Sally Bingham, who's a reverend, Reverend Sally Bingham at Grace Episcopal Church. She uh, had this, uh, she's very cool. But anyway, she had this, she, she, just, just, she gave this speech and kind of did this big thing where she said, you know, it is not our job to mess up God's creation. We should start doing something as a church. She challenged the religious community to buy green power is what she did. And so she started with her church, uh, which is like this great big Episcopal church in downtown San Francisco. And then she organized, and uh, I think that there's like 90 churches in her diocese, diocese now that are now buying green power. And uh, they went national. It's called Ecumenical Power and Light. <laughs> you know? It's pretty good, isn't it? You think that's, well, I think it was kind of, you know. It was Episcopal Power and Light is how I started. But then I was like, I was asking her, I was like, what about Lutheran Power and Light or Jewish Power and Light or Catholic Power and Light? But it is the interfaith, uh, you know, Ecumenical Power and Light and the Interfaith Power and Light uh, Initiative, the Regeneration Project. So what I'm trying to say is, is that there are a lot of people really doing good things and uh, in, a, in a lot of different arenas. So that is how change happens, with the hands of individuals. There is no social change fairy, unfortunately. There is no little magic thing that will happen to make change happen. It is the hard work of individuals, um, whether it is you know, regeneration project and the Episcopal Power and Light and Interfaith Power and Light or us on our reservation in Minnesota going to challenge the evil patents, you know? Um, that is how change happens. I, uh, you know, in the end though, I think that you and I know that, uh, and, and our teachings, you know, as Anishinaabeg people, I, I think are not unlike the teachings of others. And that, uh, you know, we have many gifts, and we do. We are kind of pitiful in terms of the context of all other things, but we have many gifts as humans, and we certainly have many gifts and privileges as North Americans that you know, are a part of us, uh, and, that, and with those come our responsibility to make change, to do the right thing. Because in the end, I think that you and I know 
that no matter where we come from or what color we are or you know what sexual orientation we are in the end um, natural law is in fact the highest law and uh, in the end we all have to drink the water we all have to breathe the air and uh, one would do well to live in accordance with natural law misugo manikmigwich thanks very much for your time Thank <laughs> you.